Our lectionary scriptures today pose before us, since if we take them all and bundle them all up, it comes down to one thought. Our behavior is important. Our behavior is important. Our behavior reflects what we think, feel, and believe. Our behavior is important. Let me share with you from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 13. I'm going to start right at verse 1. I know we are in 13 last week, but we were at the end of it. I wanted to go to the front of it. I just like 13 a lot. All right, Tom, is that okay with you? Thanks, brother. Chapter 13. At that very time, there were some present, some present who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Jesus asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, that they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Do you think they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. And then Jesus told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I've been coming and looking for fruit on this fig tree. And I still find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? The gardener replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I think I've told you before that I grew up with three brothers. Right? Is this news? Three brothers. Now, after Sunday school at my grandma's, all right, Hannah. Lived on the south side of Muncie. Rather than just going straight home, Mom would make Dad. One and I'm not sure now. He got this was the, she would make Dad take us all on a ride in the country because we lived in Albany. So we had to get now it was in the '60s. Okay, we were in a mid-sized car. All right, which was not big. So there were three of us boys in the back seat. And of course, back then, you know, no seat belts. You know, it was free grazing area there, you know. No seat belts. My youngest brother sat between mom and dad. And keep in mind, back then, the way cars were made. Do you remember how cars were made when they were in mind? This had a hard top on it. Had a hard top. Being our age, we were not tall enough when seated on that back seat to see out the windows. So our whole world on that longer than usual drive from Memorial Drive, and of course there was no bypass then, <laughs> up to Albany, was lengthened by this beautiful country that my mom and my dad got to enjoy. All right? Now shortly after the drive began, it would begin. And you know what it is. You know what I'm talking about. You're touching me! No, you're touching me. There's a line right here. Did any of you draw a line, that imaginary line, not to be crossed? And they did. They did. This is my space. Mom, he's touching me. Mom, he's looking at me. <laughs> and then came the threat. Mom would issue the threat. Now, some of you mothers know the threat by heart. I think it's genetic. I think it's genetic, guys. They know the threat. All right, Dad was a stone during these trips. Nothing. He was like in his own world. He just knew the road, and that was it. I mean, he was oblivious to everything. But not Mom. She was in tune. She was in tune. And this, this I, I, I really hate calling it a threat. Because a threat's only normally something that you threaten to do. Mom had actually done it. And you know what it is. She had actually done This was the 60s. 
All right. Yeah. Child care services not created yet. She had actually done it, what she threatened to do. So it was less of a threat, more of a promise. More of a promise. Stop it this instant, or I'll have your dad pull this car over. And I'd seen it happen and know the results personally. Know the results personally. Anyone live that? Is this a part of anyone's life ever? No, Lynn, really? You're so good. That's what it is. Yeah, that's why you just did a back slap in the car. Okay. Now, I only had one child. I mentioned you know, I had one daughter. So this isn't a, a parenting issue that I dealt with. But anyway, those days are over. It was solved by the auto industry and the creation of the minivan. The minivan, people. Come on now. You know that. That was the only reason it was so popular. <laughs> All right. Is this very issue? Come on. Mark, you know that. You and I were just talking about it. I mean, bucket seats. A third row. Holy cow. You know? Back there where there's no air conditioning, it's all heat all the time. All right? That was it. You only get exhaust to breathe. Problem solved by that minivan. And the car seats that they came out with to go into these minivans, even better. Because now the kid sits up higher than the adults, you know, fully padded, probably got stereo speakers, a game console, four cup holders, all this stuff, and they can see outside. Wow. I remember in, in that car, I don't remember what kind of car it was, it's all white, hard top, short windows, I think, were that tall in the whole car, all the way around, and in the back seat, the back window didn't go down. It had a little, like up front, of when the front part that you could flip out, and the back, it had it too. But Dad said, don't you touch it. That was the only thing. If you touched his car, that was the end. But he'd just say, don't touch that. He reckoned the uh, enforcer would get on you real quick afterward. But, uh, yeah, I mean, woo! That was minivan saved all of it. Now those days of squalling over valuable backseat real estate live on only in the stories and remembrance that my brothers and I tell that whenever we get together with Dad just to make him laugh. Because to Dad, that was, I guess, his big entertainment of the week was seeing how we would torment our mother. And it brings a smile now, but I happen to know it was painful at the time, personally. I know that, all right? I know, Jay. Woo, still bear it. And it was especially painful to mom because she would say, whenever she'd grab us by the arm and jerk us out of the car uh, and spank us beside the road, she would say, this is going to hurt me a whole lot more than you. So she must have been doubly in pain. All right, but she was tough. She bore through it. Perseverance, those mothers. We dads got nothing on them. Got nothing on them, Tom. Looking back, it seems as though whenever we left grandma's house, all we were doing was waiting for the moment to start picking a fight. It just seemed like that. I, I don't remember it not happening. Life seems full of ample opportunities to pick a fight, chances to shift blame or point fingers. Maybe it's a product of our postmodern discontent. That's what the psychologists say is the cause of all of our problems. A postmodern discontent. Seems worse than ever. I think it, it's been enhanced, this general discontent across our nation was enhanced by the pandemic and it's with the still troubled political landscape of today. And it goes beyond families. This discontent falls out of families into the communities, out of the communities all the way across the nation. Just look at how we conduct our political conversations this day. Town hall meetings are now shouting matches. Out-of-season political rallies are designed to inflame a sense of panic and frustration, which seem focused only on increasing fear of the other party. The other party, them, they who are not us, who are we? The enemy. It's their fault. They don't play fair. They aren't like us. They don't value what we value. We're all weaker because of them. Mom, they're touching me. Seems worse day by day, season by season. There wasn't the past 
I remember it whenever I was growing up watching TV and politics would come up. It seemed like there was more of a level of civility. Anyone remember those days? It seemed like it. I don't know. I wasn't really watching. I was waiting on it to end so that I could watch my shows. All right? But I think we've lost that, that level of civility. We don't... I mean... I remember whenever they would talk, these fancy dressed guys who were real smart, they look, you know, they had the look of a politician, you know, said the right stuff. Whenever they talked about the other person on the other podium, they called him the loyal opposition. Meaning, you know, we're, we're friends. He's a patriot just like I am. We just have different agendas and views. They seem to have respect, even in the political system. I mean, even political debates seem to be designed to make, uh, help us make decisions based on ideas and vision. And they weren't designed on making the other person look bad. Maybe, maybe it's just a dream. Maybe it's not how it used to be. Maybe I'm just dreaming that that would be the way it would be. Now, I know some of you here probably remember the Fairness Doctrine of the Federal Communications Commission. How many remember the Fairness Doctrine? The Fairness Doctrine of 1949? Thank you, Doc. Dean, thank you. All right. Now, the Fairness Doctrine, all right, which was adopted and enforced by the Federal Communication Division, uh, the Commission, was a policy that required broadcast journalism. And this was you know, in 1949, it was print, radio, moved into television. It, it, whenever they would cover and present a controversial issue that was deemed of public importance, they had to do it in a manner that fairly reflected differing viewpoints. Okay? That's what it was all about. If you're going to say something, you got to say both show, tell both sides of the story. Okay? I, I remember this on the evening news. I don't remember how many times. And it was on 60 Minutes, they do it too. Uh, point, counterpoint, any remember that? Had that lady journalist and the fella, you know, they have differing viewpoints. But, you know, they weren't yelling at each other. They were just providing viewpoints. Well, that policy was introduced in 1949, and it was abolished in 1987. Abolished in 1987. And uh, they didn't do a very good job of monitoring it, that's for sure. But it opened the door to one-sided media journalism that we enjoy today. Now, by now, you're probably asking yourselves in the pew, and what does all this have to do with anything, Pastor Tim? Were you asking yourself that, Penny? What does all this have to do with anything? Or at least with our scripture text for this week, right? What does all this have to do? Surely Luke doesn't present us with a political hornet's nest designed to pick a fight. Or does he? Our gospel reading from Luke seems to provide seemingly obscure historical references and an even more obscure agricultural parable. Is this what we need to hear this third Sunday in the season of Lent? A time of repentance and reflection. Or reflection and repentance. Is this what we need to hear? But let's look at it. Luke introduces this chapter by saying that some present... Some of the people who were there, okay, some present. In our Bibles, or your pew Bibles say some present. That's how they're known. <clears throat> they came to tell Jesus about an event that happened. Now, we don't have a clue who these some present folks are. Were they just average Joes and James going about their daily business and trying to get by who wanted to make sure that Jesus had been reading the newspapers? Now I know what you're thinking, but I got proof that they had newspapers back then because Exodus and Leviticus say they had an olive press. And remember,
Shepherd New Testament says that in the Bethlehem Star. So I got newspapers back then, you know. Thank you, Jay, for that smirk. I love that. So we know they got those. So maybe they were just wondering, hey, Jesus, are you up on current events? What do you think about this? What do you think about this? These people who were killed, did you hear about it? You guys remember back in high school, taking the speech class? Jay and I went to Delta. They had speech in the auditorium. We were talking this morning about it. We both took the class. It was an elective, of course. I loved it. Loved getting up and talking. Can you imagine that? You know, because the other kids couldn't go nowhere. Yeah, that was the best part. Hold on, what does that remind you of? <laughs> they had all sorts of speeches that you had to learn. All right? I thought you just got up and talked. Well, they had all kinds, all right? They had the persuasive, they had the informative, they had the acceptance, they had the demonstrative, and so on. Remember those? But what they never told you in speech class was that there was really no such thing as an informative speech. Informative speech. Those were what were called lectures. This was speech class, not lecture class. Everyone has an agenda. All those types of speeches have an agenda. They were not informative. They had an agenda. One of the questions we have to ask is, why did some present, right there where Jesus was, tell Jesus' story? Or why did they pose this puzzle to him? Did they really think he hadn't heard of this instance where these people were killed? Now, i got to tell you the truth here. The truth is, we don't know about the event referenced here at all. Either one for that instance. A peep, be some presence bring up the Galileans who were killed while offering sacrifice. Jesus brings up yet another event, a, probably a stone tower somewhere in town, maybe, fell. I don't know what the building code was back then. Fell and killed some people who were passing by at the time because they didn't expect the tower to fall. Don't know if it was a big tower. Don't know if it was one rock. Hard to say. I have nothing to verify anything about there ever being a tower of uh, a Siloam or its falling. Couldn't find anything specific, specific about the Galileans who were killed making sacrifices. Because none of the other Gospels have it, all right, have mention of this event, and there isn't any real historical account that identifies what happened that I could reference. Now, there is speculation and rumor. Speculation and rumor, all right? I know we're always up for a good rumor. So let's look at some. Let's look at Pilate. Pontius Pilate, not airline Pilate. Pontius Pilate was the governor of Judea, in the time of Jesus' ministry, right? And this is breaking news to some present. So they're bringing it to Jesus. So Pilate would have been in charge of the Romans then. All right? Now, despite the gospel accounts, the gospel seems to make him sound helpless, or at best, as if he was quite wishy-washy about stuff. Like, he wouldn't take a stand. He kind of just would buckle to the will of the people, that kind of stuff. All right? But I got to tell you, that's not who he was. All right? Elsewhere in historical writings, Pontius Pilate was a pretty nasty piece of work. All right? Pontius Pilate was in charge of a legion, all right, of Roman soldiers. He led them into several battles, was very successful, amassed quite a bit of wealth. All right? This is a time when. Rome is being attacked on its boundaries by nomadic bands, and Pilate was aggressive. All right? And his legion, and he coordinated with other legions and successfully defended Rome and won many battles, and they were bloody. All right? But Pilate had said some things about a certain person, and by happenstance, that person becomes Caesar. All right? Now, if whenever somebody's not your boss and you talk about them and then they become your boss, expect not a promotion, all right? So, 
How about we take this guy who wins these battles and is popular with the people and let's send him to Judea where he'll be forgotten. Where he'll be forgotten. So Pilate shipped off to this backwater region of the Roman Empire where he proceeds to take out his anger on the natives at regular intervals. Pilate was always rubbing the official divine status of the emperor in the faces of the Jews who considered it blasphemy because to the Jew and to us there is only one God. To the Romans, Caesar was God. And they, that, was, that was wrong. So he's rubbing that in their face. He was constantly revoking the special status of the temple treasury and claiming funds for his own purpose. It's like if the town board come in and say, hey, I want 50% of your offering this week because we can. And that's how it would work, all right? He'd walk off with the money. He frequently spoiled the religious festivals and feast days by making burdensome public decrees that prohibited or limited their celebrations. So when we think about the story of what happened to these people in the temple, you have to remember it was a very rough time in Jerusalem. The seeds of revolution were, were being spread everywhere. All right? So uh, and there was a faction there in uh, Judea. There were, three, uh, there were four factions of Jews at the time that were popular. Because of the exodus, they were no longer family boundary areas. There were more of these groups of folks of a certain thought. There were the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Essenes, but they died off pretty quick because, you know, they didn't believe in marriage. So they don't really pick up a lot of followers after a while, all right? And then there were the Zealots. Zealots were passionate about one thing above all else, all right? Not just, they just didn't want Israel to be a separate nation. They were zealous about kicking out any invader who was in their country. They were quite passionate about it, all right? They wanted other people to be passionate about it. So the story goes that there were rumors of an uprising coming in Jerusalem, and Pilate, as he had oftentimes sent undercover soldiers into the temple to find and dispatch the ringleaders, which the undercover soldiers did with frightening Roman efficiency. Right in the courtyards of the temple, they would stab people, and that human blood of these victims would mingle with the blood of the animal sacrifices that were being offered. All right, right there. And that immediately profaned the worship that day. Not only that, it made the temple. We're talking the holy temple of God in Jerusalem unclean for a period of days. It was more like 14 to so two weeks. It would take for the rituals of cleansing to be performed before another sacrifice could be offered. So most likely these some present that Luke mentions in the first verse were there trying to get Jesus to take a side on a political debate, an issue, a political issue. Who are you for? Now they might have been zealots who wanted Jesus to come out on their side and their, you know, and join their revolutionary agenda because Jesus was drawing a crowd. Or they might have been the establishment all right, more of the Pharisaical or the Sadducean establishment who were hoping that Jesus would say something, something that would get the Romans interested enough to take care of their problem, which was Jesus. Or there might have been people appalled that such a thing could take place and wanted some answer. To that ever question, ever present question that even we today have upon our hearts. Why? Why did this happen? Why to them? Why to me? Now here's here's what I got. True to form, Jesus doesn't do any of the things that they hoped he would do. He doesn't take a side one way or the other, and he doesn't answer why. He refuses to engage in a finger, a political finger pointing and name calling. At the same time, he sidesteps the theological issues of whether the people had somehow deserved their fate. Because if they didn't, 
then the world would suddenly seem less safe. And terrible things <laughs> it definitely makes people scared whenever you tell them terrible things happen to innocent people. He didn't want to do any of that. Now, he does weigh in on this, but only to deny its reality that there were worse sinners than we are. He will not answer whether sinners worse than us deserve their fate. He doesn't answer that. Not at all. As a matter of fact, he emphatically says, No, I tell you! I think that's pretty definitive. But then he goes on with that repent stuff that Jesus is always talking about. Right? Though some present back then, and we who are present today, have to ask, Wait a minute, Jesus. You just said that sinfulness is not the reason they died so horribly. So why do we need to repent? It won't save us from dying. But this is how I believe from reading this, how Jesus would respond. Salvation is not about dying. Hear me, people. Salvation is not about dying. It's about living. That's what he tells them. Then he shares this parable about this fig tree that's barren. And that parable essentially asks each of us, each of us, how do you intend to live? How do you intend to live? Do you want to be one of those who simply takes up space, one of those who's a waste of dirt? Or do you want to be one who produces the fruit, the fruit of the Spirit? Do you want your life to amount to something? Or for your death to be simply another statistic? This makes all the energy we spend casting blame and picking fights seem kind of pointless, doesn't it? This is the point of the whole thing. All these nine verses, it's, it's quite a lot to read through. And I've heard takes on it all over the place. I've been where you are listening to preachers come up with it. But i got to tell you, these nine verses simply come down to one thing. It's just one question. Jesus in this 13th chapter of Luke is pointed directly at each of us today. It's a perfect Lenten season question that Jesus is trying to ask of us. He was trying to ask it back then, but they couldn't get it. He's asking us today. I think it's one worth reflecting on during our time of Lent. And not only reflecting on it, getting to the answer. And possibly repenting. That question posed by Jesus to each of us is what are you living for? What are you living for? Think about it. This is Lent. Reflect on that question. Amen. It's a cliffhanger, sir.